I just have to say, and I don't know if I'm over-reading this, but is this a, a discreet Justin Bieber reference? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. I was like, we invited him, but he declined. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, okay. We commissioned a song. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I have a soundtrack. Okay. Um, so Cleo Wolfley Erskine is pursuing a PhD in the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley, where he is studying how local knowledge and ecological science are shaping salmon restoration practices on a Northern California stream. And Dan Sarna is a PhD candidate in Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley, here, where he is studying the social and environmental history of watershed management in the Klamath Basin in Northern California, which is just stunningly gorgeous. So. All right. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. We're delighted and honored to be here. I'm Dan Sarna, graduate student in ESPM. I'm Cleo, um, a graduate student in ERG. So we spoke to some beaver beavers um, about the title of our talk, and they said, damn them all, the streams that is. The story we will tell you today is of beaver believers, beaver deceivers, and other watershed entanglements. And we'll start out with a situated story that comes out of my research in the Klamath Basin. Um, in the spring of 2010, the Mid-Klamath Watershed Council, a nonprofit NGO, and the fisheries department of the Kaduk tribe were collaborating on a stream restoration or recuperation project, I should say, <coughs> in the Syed Valley of the Klamath. Um, and they were putting in brush bundles into the stream to uh, increase channel complexity, increase the depth of the pools, and create better habitat for coho salmon. Um, when they came back to check on their project a few days later, they discovered that the brush bundles had all gone missing. Um, and so after some investigations, they discovered that a group of beavers had stolen their brush bundles and they were eating them and adding them to their dams. And so their first reaction was, Damn you beavers! <laughs> and then, that same spring, they, um, the tribe and the Watershed Council were collaborating on a recuperation project downstream that um, involved a similar amount of labor and equipment, but before they could bring in the bulldozers, a family of beaver constructed a five-foot dam at the exact location of the proposed project. <laughs> and so, the, according to the director of the Watershed Council, The beaver were doing everything we had been trying to do, except the beaver were doing it better, faster, and at no cost to us. <laughs> so when they, when they came back to check on this pond at the, at the end of the summer, when a lot of the tributaries around had dried up, they noticed that thousands of coho and chinook salmon were utilizing the ponds. And so they decided that they took this as a sign that the beaver had um, received their project proposal but had decided to implement it in-house. <laughs> <laughs> so this story of beaver uh, re restoration uh, on, on Boys Creek is a founding myth of the self-titled Beaver Believer movement. Uh, based on their encounters that summer, the mid Klamath Watershed Council and the Karuk tribe realized the restoration of threatened coho salmon in the Klamath River system may be intricately tied to enhanced beaver populations and restoration projects that mimic the positive benefits of beaver dams. Take note, here a group of humans are looking to beaver for advice on riparian repair. So this beaver believer movement emerged in the mid-2000s against the backdrop of increased conflict over water uh, and was motivated in part by the 1997 Endangered Species Act listing uh, of coho salmon. Three scorching summers had extirpated wild coho from the Russian River Basin. An, increased, an increasing late summer stream flow became a top priority. An influential 2003 paper by Pollock and others concluded, Beaver dams measurably affect the rates of groundwater recharge and stream discharge. They retain enough sediment to cause measurable changes in valley floor morphology, and generally they enhance stream habitat quality for many fishes. Some biologists began questioning established doctrine that beaver dams were bad for fish. According to Brock Dolman, coming face to face with beaver ponds during a 2009 field trip was a turning point. It really changed people's minds. We went out there and the beaver dams were just teeming with coho. A critical mass of fish biologists realized that beaver, long absent from California coastal watersheds, could fundamentally shift the hydrology of dehydrated California streams. As Dolman put it, suddenly beaver was not a four-letter word. <laughs> <laughs> Collaboration with beavers was hot. Michael Pollack gave charismatic talks where he showed pictures of beaver dam support structures. 
Um, I could go back. So these are these hosts that are driven into the, the, the river downstream of a beaver dam that keeps it from, from, flow, from uh, washing out at really high flows. Uh, informal networks of scientists and advocates uh, began to assemble at conferences such as the State of the Beaver, an unusual gathering organized by non-scientists who wanted to enlist science to confirm what local knowledge holders knew, that streams stayed wetter when beavers were around, and that beaver dammed re reaches grew big fish. So when we first started talking about these beaver turns we were witnessing in watersheds across California, we were first taken by the, the social and political and institutional dimensions of the turn to beaver, um, and by the fact that beavers seem to be convening new kinds of publics, um, opening up sites of mutual witnessing and collective deliberation, opening up space for the elaboration of common worlds across species lines. And they also seem to be creating new private spaces as well, new spaces of privation or non-interference and secrecy, especially with regards to negotiations around the nature of private property and the right of landowners to trap and kill beaver if they were harming their property. Um, and then we were also interested from a governance perspective in how debates around beaver were changing the relationships between um, state, federal, and tribal agencies and local landowners and NGOs. Um, and so while we're still going forward, we're still really interested in the way that um, beaver has become a site for this formation of new alliances and coalitions and rivalries among humans. We're also um, becoming a lot more interested in the role that the beaver themselves are playing in kind of seeding these, these coalitions um, and the way that they're responding to these attempts at cross-species solidarity. So uh, from a beaver's perspective, there's a lot of trees that are very um, good to chew on uh, and, and good to build with. Um, before the fur trade swept across North America, an estimated 60 million beaver were chewing down trees, damming streams, and digging wells and marshes. If we could translate their actions into a rallying cry, it would be... Damn them all! <laughs> In the words of explorer and cartographer David Thompson, North America was once... <laughs> In the possession of two distinct races of beings, man and beaver. During Manifest Destiny in the Fur Desert era, beaver were seen as fur bearers, killable for profit, and quote, hairy banknotes for empire building. By the 1830s, beaver were nearly extirpated, and evidence of their ecosystem engineering decayed soon after, leaving a false image of pristine beaverless rivers in the scientific literature and the popular imagination. In the words of Michael Pollack, for all of the scientific studies on beaver, very few have addressed the cumulative effects of the widespread dam removal experiment conducted across North America over the past few centuries. It is likely that the hydrologic, geomorphologic, and biological cumulative effects are and continue to be substantial. Depression-era reintroductions in drought-stricken California and Idaho attempted to halt erosion and increase stream flow. Spectacular parachute airdrops of pairs of beavers into remote corners of the state uh, were mostly successful in reestablishing populations and cast beavers as heroic renegades. One beaver, named Geronimo by his handlers, was dropped from an airplane a hundred times to press different models of cages that opened on impact. The beaver reintroduction initiatives were decentralized, ad hoc, and never coalesced into a coherent agency policy or a widespread movement. During the half-century dry spell in the scientific literature on beaver's hydroecological effects during the second half of the 20th century, beaver were expanding their territories. As beaver chewed their way back up their old streams, they encountered different kinds of humans, including funny kinds. These humans cast beavers as different kinds of agents, as marauders, as flutters, as ecological saviors, depending on where they build their dams. Culverts, roads, irrigation ditches, these are favorite targets of beaver engineers. Um, and in these places, beavers are cast as nuisances to be trapped or blown out with dynamite. A beaver that chews down an orchard or a favorite, li favorite lilac bush becomes a problem beaver. Wildlife defenders, such as the Humane Society uh, and animal rights activists, cast beavers as morally significant per persons worthy of respect and dignity regardless of their effects on humans. Um, all of these groups acknowledge the agency of beaver, but this agency is seen as multivalent and often dangerous. New conceptions of beaver as keystone species add new layers of significance to the capacity of beavers to act. Beavers are cast as eco-saviors amidst calls for river restoration practitioners to abandon their, quote, industrial beavers, their track hose, 
for cheap and cheerful collaborations with the original ecosystem engineers. And so all of these portrayals of, of beaver agency, the capacity of beavers to act, have very different implications for how we should live with beaver, how to get on with them or without them. And so what we're becoming fascinated by and what we're going to focus on moving forward is how science, with a capital S, in the singular, not the plural, this is royal science, expert, objective-driven science, is being used to adjudicate between these different portrayals of beaver and beaver agency and determine definitively whether or not their capacity to act is beneficial for humans, coho, and watershed ecosystems. And so we're really looking at how science is now being used to determine where and under what circumstances beavers are being permitted to live in proximity to humans and under what, what conditions they must die. Um, and so going forward, we're really focusing on on knowledge practices, on the, the way in which different individuals and institutions are generating and circulating knowledge about beaver, about how claims about beaver are being, in art being articulated in front of various audiences, about how these claims um, gain traction in certain forums and are transformed into facts of nature. Um, and we're really interested in how beaver science, as it's being assembled and disassembled, made, contested, and performed in front of various audiences, how it's uh, influencing individual and collective action. Um, with regards to watershed management. Um, and also one of the things that we're looking into is um, the ways in which beavers and wildlife scientists are responding to one another. So we're asking wildlife scientists about their relationships with particular beavers and beaver colonies on and off the field in their day-to-day -day scientific practices and in their everyday worlds. And we're trying to get at how these scientists' encounters with these significant others are impacting the way that they practice and situate their science. Um, and then from the beavers' perspective, we're also trying to grapple with how the beavers themselves are participating, cooperating, or resisting these attempts of humans to survey, experiment, manage, and build coalitions with them. So very briefly in our last couple of minutes, we're going to run through our three case studies and, and show some of our key um, questions and, and, and insights. So in the mid Klamath, despite the fact that there are a number of beaver believers among the NGOs and the tribal governments and the state and federal agencies, um, they can't seem to get permits to do stream bed alteration and help beavers set up dams. And so what they're doing is just collecting data on the dams that beavers have already set up. And they're trying to make the case by accumulating evidence that beavers are good for coho. Um, a little bit upstream in the Scott River, in the Scott River, the Scott Valley was actually called Beaver Valley. Um, that was its first Anglo name. Um, and all of the beaver were trapped. There were thousands of beavers. It was just teeming with beavers. And they were all trapped out by the 1830s and 1840s. Um, and um, once all the gold was taken out, all of the people who stayed, all the miners who stayed around turned to ranching. And so most of the water is now being used to grow alfalfa for cattle production in the valley. And um, the Watershed Council and the Scott and the Quartz Valley Indian Tribe and the Cutter Tribe are trying to use beaver to restore some of the watershed processes there. Um, except they're running, to a lot, running into a lot of conflicts with landowners who don't want um, beavers flooding their fields or eating their orchards and crops. And, and so the Watershed Council is trying to intervene and um, pass out information on the Beaver Believer movement and give farmers some strategies for coping with beavers, such as beaver deceivers, which um, let out some of the flow behind beaver dams before they um, flood the farmers' fields. And then on Salmon Creek, which is in Sonoma County, beaver actually are absent, uh, but people want to bring them back. And a, an obstacle to this is that these beaver, because they were uh, reintroduced at one point from Idaho, are considered non-native non nuisance species. And so it's illegal to transport them from one place to the other, um, even if people want them on their land, which some do. So they're trying to amass historical evidence using um, diaries from Fort Ross, uh, and, and also historical photographs and accounts, uh, and, and to try to find old uh, abandoned beaver dams to document that beaver were here, um, in the hopes that the scientific evidence will convince the State Department of Fish and Wildlife to change their, uh, their rules about beavers. And because beavers are absent here, the potential of their reintroduction, uh, as you can see in this fly over here, um, as these ecosystem engineers, as these bringers of water, um, is a very kind of interesting and, and different um, context from reintroductions that have happened in the past. So it'll be an interesting site to uh, see how this the relationship develops. Um, so in our in conclusion, um, we're very interested. Um, we can see we think we've traced some of the entanglements that are emerging in all of these cases between science, between local knowledge, between human and, and non-human. And these are some of the uh, the the theories that we find really useful um, in addressing 
these entanglements, which we'll explore further. And so we just want to uh, close with a quote um, from Van Doren that kind of addresses these entanglements nicely. Inside rich histories of entangled becoming, it is ultimately impossible to reach simple black and white prescriptions about how ecologies should be. And so we are required to make a stand for some possible worlds and not others. We are required to begin to take responsibility for the ways in which we help to tie and retie our knotted multi species worlds. Thank you. Thank you.